So I understand there's a Ravens game today, a one o'clock start, right? So I have a sermon with 20 points to it to share with you this morning. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll make it as, I, I told Bill that I was going to speak as slowly as possible, like the slowest I've ever spoken in my whole life, which first of all would be a miracle from God because we all know that I can't speak slowly, <laughs> but I'm not really that mean. We're in the second week of our sermon series, A Place to Call Home, that is our uh, stewardship sermon series. And in it, for the next uh, the four weeks of this sermon series, we're looking at different characteristics of our church, of here at Epworth, that we wanted to lift up both as a joy that we've seen them in this place, but also as a challenge for the ways that we are supposed to interact together as a church family. They lift up to us the reasons that we give, what our giving provides for people when they come into this place, and it also lifts up um, a reason that we give in thankfulness that we've experienced God in these ways and want to give thanks for that. Last week, we talked about what uh, it means to belong, that fundamental need that all of us have to belong to someone and something bigger than us. And we talked about how God provides that for us in the midst of a community of faith. From the very beginning, we belong to God, and God spends all of our lives calling us back into that relationship with him and into a relationship of authenticity with one another. And that's one of the things we seek to provide here at Epworth is a place for people to belong. The second uh, thing we want to talk about this week is a place for healing. In the New Testament, in Scripture, the Greek word for healing is a word called sozo. Can everybody say that? Sozo? It's actually one of the easiest Greek words in the New Testament, I think. And it means many things. It means healing, but it also means salvation and wholeness. So all throughout the Gospels, any time that Jesus is healing someone physically, he is also making them whole and providing for them salvation. Because healing isn't just about one piece of us, it's about all of us. And salvation isn't just about one piece of us, it's about all of who we are. So I want to talk about that this morning. Healing comes in many forms. Sometimes we are ill physically in our bodies and we need physical healing. Sometimes we have emotional wounds left from things that other people have said or done to us. Or maybe we have spiritual wounds that have worked their way into our spirit. Or mental wounds, illnesses of the mind that need God's healing touch. All of these things can affect all of who we are. Emotional wounds affect us physically, and physical wounds affect us emotionally. And all of it can affect our faith and belief in God. This morning's scripture lesson from Luke is a lesson about healing, and it's one of my favorite healing stories in the Gospels. Now, Jesus does a lot of healing in all four of the Gospels. He heals blind men. If you remember, one of the times he heals a blind man, he um, tells him to spit on his hands, and he rubs mud in it and makes him rub it on his eyes, which has always kind of grossed me out a little. He heals men with um, skin diseases like leprosy. He heals little girls, even bringing one back from the dead. He heals the bent-over woman who, uh, in, our, in our song this morning, it says afterwards she uh, stood up and leapt for joy. He heals a woman who's been bleeding for years just because she reached out and touched his cloak in faith. But this healing story in Luke is my favorite because of the way that it happens, because it involves his friends, it involves other people. Now, most people who had been sick, like this man was, would have lost a lot of friends by now. Because the world around him would have blamed his illness, his inability to walk, on his sins. And they wouldn't have wanted to be around him for fear of being contaminated, that his sin would rub off on them. But also, because of the way their laws worked, he would have been considered unclean. So helping him, touching him in any way, would have meant that they had to do extra work to be presented in places of worship. It was work to be this man's friend. But what I love about the story is that these people didn't care. They saw a need in him and were willing to do whatever it took to get him to help. And as we know from the story, getting him help wasn't easy. They couldn't simply just walk him in the front door to this place where Jesus was. There was too much going on in the house. There were too many people crowding around that day. And so they couldn't get him through to Jesus by ordinary means. So they literally tore the roof off of the building and lowered him down. 
When we were in um, Israel in January, one of the things we did was to visit um, a first century village that they've set up. And I, do you remember what town it was in, Donna? I couldn't remember this morning. No. Neither. It was like eight months ago. Neither of us can remember that far back. Um, but it's set up to look like a first century town. So they showed us um, a wine press from the first century, and they had animals. They showed us a cave uh, that would have looked like where Jesus had been born, and they had a house set up. And I was going to show you pictures this morning, but my thumb drive failed. So maybe we'll put them up on Facebook. But I wanted to show you what? Nazareth, Nazareth thank you. That's right, first century Nazareth. Now it all makes sense. Um, so we'll put them up on Facebook because I couldn't get my thumb drive to work. But what I wanted you to know is that the structure of the roof the, had wooden trusses. And in between the wooden trusses, there were um, kind of um, lattices made of straw that were woven together. And there were multiple layers of the straw lattices. And it would take them, uh, they made yearly um, repairs made just prior to the rainy season. But one of the things um, the guy who gave us this tour told us was that it probably would have taken about five minutes for them to tear the roof off and to lower the guy down. But it would have probably taken six months for them to repair the, um, to repair the work that they had done. So this wasn't something that they did without knowing the work it was going to take to repair it. These were desperate men doing desperate measures to get their friend the healing that he needed. I think that as a church, we're called to be like these men. We're called to bring our friends to healing, to provide a space where people can come to know God's healing love and grace, to help them get the sozo, the healing and wholeness and salvation, the kind of healing that takes care of all of who they are, and that changes our very being. And we are to do it by any means necessary. If that means getting dirty every once in a while, if it means getting out of our own way, or even having to spend extra time repairing our neighbor's roof whom we've ruined, then we need to do it. Every week in our sermon series, we're going to be watching a video of a testimony from one of our members about how they have experienced this particular characteristic. And this week, our video is um, by a woman named Jan Morey. For those of you who don't know Jan, she started coming here to Epworth um, about three year, two years ago when Peter um, served for a year as her grandson as our music director. And so I want you to watch what Jan said about how she's experienced healing here, and then I'm going to tell you a few more things uh, about how we can provide that for other people. Will you play the video? When Pastor Trish asked me to speak about healing, I thought it would be easy because 2000 has certainly been the year of my healing. But it isn't easy. It's hard to share. To go back a little, I came to this church in 2012. I was very depressed. I came here because Peter came here to be the music director. I hadn't gone to church for a while. It was hard when my husband was ill. Then I didn't want to go because I was hurt and angry because he died. My husband, Phil, had been my first date, my first kiss. My husband for 42 years. We shared joy and hardship, raised two sons, and raised a grandson. We went through his nine-year illness together. I had no life left. I was an empty nester whose plan for a great retirement with lots of travel was over. 2012 and 13 and 14 passed with very little improvement for me. I was depressed, cried a lot, especially at church. Phil had been my spiritual shepherd. What now? I believed in Phil and he believed in God and that had worked for me. I didn't know the Bible or I guess know God. I knew that God had given up on me when I was so mad at him. I wanted to die. There was no reason to live. No one needed me. No one cared enough to see through my pain. I sat alone in church, and if I wasn't in the choir, I felt alone. I didn't stay for fellowship because no one spoke to me. Then one Sunday when I couldn't stop crying, Pastor Trish came back into the sanctuary to talk to me. I was devastated and desolated. I had hit rock bottom. She sat with me and touched my hand and listened to my sadness. She wanted to help 
and asked me to come talk to her. It took me a while, but I did go talk to her. I told her I had no purpose, but a little part of me wanted to believe that God might have a purpose for me if I could forgive, if he could forgive me for being so mad at him. She talked about my part in the healing, taking baby steps, becoming a part of this church. She invited me to join a Bible study and both learn and take a chance on making a friend. It was quite a revelation to think I needed to help myself. But I wanted to believe she was right, that God had not given up on me. Going to a Bible study was scary. Singing in the choir was hard. Believing God cared about me seemed impossible. But slowly, as I listened to others and shared and learned, I began to understand my part in this a little better. One evening, I was so sad again at Bible study, and someone else in the group cried because of my story. I realized then I could choose to be a positive or a negative influence. I studied and read and prayed lots more and made a decision to be purposely joyful, to be thankful every day. My new philosophy has become to take in joy and give out peace. So every day, I'm learning to be more positive to look for joy, to be purposely thankful, to spread my wings and be a little less afraid. Today's devotional I read said, go and care for the people you love and for those you do not yet love. So touch someone sad, to sit with someone alone, to share a Bible verse, to invite someone to church or to a different activity could save them, even heal them. I think it saved me. I want to tell you, um, Jan's not here today because she um, sings with a Sweet Adeline group, one of the a cappella um, women's barbershop groups, and they uh, won their regionals, so they are in Las Vegas this week competing in the international competition. And I think her Facebook said they got 11, do you remember, Nancy? 12, her group got 12. So when you see her come back next week, please tell her congratulations, because that's amazing. So Jan started coming to, um, to Bible study, she met a friend that she now walks with every week, and she met other people in the group that have been able to support her and encourage her, and she has taught them, and she has taught me, and we have taught her all together. It's been an amazing year since Jan joined uh, our Bible study. So I want you to think about what, she he what you heard from her a minute. One of the things that she said, um, and I asked her to do this video because she said it in Bible study one day and it caught my attention. She said that our Bible study group helped her come from a place of desperation and desolation to a place of healing and hope. Isn't that beautiful? That's what we're able to do when we're acting as the hands and feet of Christ. We helped her reclaim her joy and she gave a little piece of joy to each of us. At Epworth, that's what we are called to do. We are called to give people permission to be involved in their own healing process. We're called to lower people down into the roof so that Jesus can touch them and heal them. But I also want you to hear that she said we contributed a little bit to the pain that she was in. The times we didn't see her, the times we didn't say hello, and I'm certainly one of the guilty ones, the times we were unsure of who she was or were too busy talking to our friends hurt her and made her feel alone. The times we didn't sit by her because we had our usual place or maybe we were worried that if we sat too close to us she'd think we were weird made her feel like she didn't want to be here. This time we were able to change that. We were able to make her feel a part of us and feel like she belonged and help in her feeling pro healing process. But what about the times we haven't changed that for people? I love the challenge that Jan gave us at the end of her video, to touch somebody who's sad, to share a Bible verse, to sit next to somebody who's lonely, to share the love of God. That's what we're called to do, and that's how we help people receive the healing that God offers. We want to be a people of healing and hope. We want to be like the friends in our gospel lesson, lowering those who need it down to a place of healing and hope. A few days ago, I went to... Um, the funeral service for Joe, our former choir director. 
And the pastor, Pastor Tim, opened the service with this uh, wonderful metaphor that I wanted to share with you, and I wrote to thank him for giving it to me because it became the ending of my sermon. It touched me so much. He was talking about how uh, when we are in a boat on the water, he loves to sail. He was talking specifically about sailing. I'm a failure at sailing. I mostly canoe. It's about as much as I can handle. But when we're in a boat on a storm, uh, in a boat on the water and a storm comes, what we do is we reach first to grab something stronger than us. We uh, reach to the bow or we grab onto the side of the boat or uh, to hold on to something that will keep us steady in the midst of a storm. And he said that that's what the community of faith provides us when storms come into our lives. We can grab on to the community of faith around us because it is stronger than we are as individuals. But it is also stronger because the community of faith points us back towards something even stronger than that. It points us towards God. It points us toward the healing and hope and love and grace that God can offer us. And it reminds us of that again and again and again on the days when we can't remember it for ourselves. That's what those friends did. They reminded him that healing was available, and then they took him to the place where he could receive it. Friends, let's be the ones who care more than others think is wise. Let's be the kind of friends and the kind of church family who dream more than others think it is practical, who expect more than others think is possible, who risk more than others think is safe, just so that those we love and those we don't love yet may find healing in the relationship with God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.